Come on. CT Fletcher saying he was yes. here. Yes. 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 Go get it, girl. Yes, I believe in you. Yes. 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 Go. Okay, so we're here with Josh and Heidi. Where are we actually? Where are we, we in Irvine? Irvine. Or? Irvine, Irvine, California. Irvine, California. Irvine, California. <laughs> Wherever it is, it's beautiful, it's sunny, and um, yeah, and I'm watching people throw spears. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully not at you. <laughs> no, no. I've never, I must admit, I've never seen that before. You know, that's definitely a first. Uh, <laughs> we might have to get you to throw one before you go there. Yeah, I'm going to have to give that a go. Fitness on Fire is about community, number one. Uh, we're about community, we're about good coaching, we're about self-development. Those are the three things that we believe a lot in. What Spartan has become for us is something our community bonds with and it's something our community trains for together. And so um, a lot of the times it's become more of an anchor for our team to have something that we're working towards. A lot of times they get bent and they're like, okay, now what? And that's kind of what this is for us. It's that, and, and then what program? Or now what program? Right. Then once you, you move well, you've gotten strong, you can do things with your body. And we try to encourage people to go out and do something with that fitness, right? And that's what all this stuff's about. Pretty much if you ever earn a medal at Fitness on Fire while you train here, then we're gonna get you on the Wall of Fame. So okay. uh, we'll get a picture from the race, we'll have you sign the picture, and it goes up forever. Um, and we have athletes of all kinds. We've got youth athletes, um, your baseball, hockey players, basketball players, football players. We've got your obstacle racing athletes, your, your grown-ups, bodybuilding contestants. Um, kettlebell competitors, uh, pretty much every type of race, American Ninja Warrior, <laughs> kind of neat. And so some of these members honestly don't come here anymore, but as long as they as long as long they earned it while they're here, they're gonna stay on the wall. And yeah. it's something neat, because when they do come back sometimes, they'll show their friends like, hey, that's me on the wall. And yeah. it's, it's created a, a really uh, neat sense of accomplishment yeah. for people. Yeah, this is the main room. This is our, uh, like the metabolic conditioning room of sorts. And I'll start with what I think is the most important, which is the mindset behind training, right? And it might sound, cliche or cheesy, but sometimes you're going through a hard set and you'll look up and you'll see something like I can and it gets you through. Um, we try to, we believe that the way you do one thing is the way you probably do most things. And so the principles of fitness, the things that we learn in the gym, setting goals, working hard to attain those goals, believing when you don't know if you can or not, but believing that you're going to keep working until you get it, all those things, um, I think translate into um, your work life, your relationships, so on and so forth. So we try to help people become better people, and then it's just kind of wrapped up in the fitness product. Right. And so mindset was the first thing. When we said we were going to get the gym, um, this is one of the first things we wanted to do is have a quote wall and start to encourage that mindset. Please. Again, really, we teach a couple of things. We teach like this hierarchy of movement. We teach the idea that you have to move well first. Right. So when people come into the gym, a lot of people, because we do a lot of Spartan and obstacle racing, um, a lot of people come in and they're like, I want to learn how to climb a rope but they can't lift their shoulders overhead. So if you can't lift your shoulders overhead, you're not, you're not really qualified to climb a rope yet. So the first thing we have to do is make sure your shoulders work the way shoulders are supposed to work. We have to create good movement first, right? right. So once we've built a good base of good movement, then we look at strength training. We look at how do we progress somebody to, just we talk about strength takes care of everything. If you're strong, you're gonna be injury resilient. If you're strong, um, you'll be able to last long, you'll be, so on and so forth. So kind of like general physical preparedness, GPP, um, we make sure that our athletes get strong. So they move well, they get strong. And then after that's all set, you've got that foundation, then um, we try to invite them to go do something with that fitness. Right. And so for some of our members, getting fit is enough. And then for some of our members, it's like, how can I be the top guy in the gym and what category and whatnot? So this is a part of that, which is the idea that if our top five in anything we do in the gym actually gets put up on the board and it becomes something that has added some healthy competition in the gym. Right. Every, about every quarter we do what's called the Grace Challenge. So right. it, en it encompasses some of these um, movements. Right. So it rallies the community behind these, these movements. Yeah. Um, some people do better when they have a community behind them. Right. They, ha they have a little bit more in them. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. The testing day, it's crazy. There's like, exactly. there's like 50 people in here. So you're doing your, you're going for a strict kettlebell press and you're struggling. you got a room full of people like, ah, and then you're like, ah, you get him. It's like, yeah. And it, it, yeah, there's definitely a, a huge energy with it. So it helps a lot. And how do you, do, are these sort of dates on the calendar where you sort of say, right, we're going to do a challenge day or how, how does that work? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah it's pretty much right. at least one Saturday a month. We do some type of open gym thing. Right. Um, Open gym might be like a community gym thing. We have open gym every day. People can come and work out all day long. But um, 
but we have like a day that's scheduled for like to invite your friends, family, kind of a community day. And right. on those days are the days that we normally test and let people get a, a yeah. chance to officially make it make it real. So if we can help people get strong in these positions, they tend to live better quality of life all around. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so here at Venice Fire, you're gonna crawl, you're gonna climb, you're gonna lunge, you're gonna jump, you're gonna you're gonna use your body um, more so than if you went to a gym that you're just gonna sit on a machine and you know, push them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why Spartan and all the obstacle racing stuff kind of resonated with us is because it's it's very natural movement. It's just, it's not like how much do you bench, bro? It's more like, can you get over that wall or not? It's more about your skills. Can you can you get across the monkey bars? It's So it really puts a more human element into training, I think. Right. And so that's why we continue to build this stuff. So things such as like the, the multi-rig, where it's kind of like hot lava. Once you get up there, you're not supposed to touch the ground. You got to get right. from one ring to the, to the bell on the other end. Um, things like rope climb, um, things like the monkey bars across the top, that kind of stuff, it, it just it resonates with that more human right. message. Yeah. Um, but other things is we just celebrate all things fitness. So there's a good chance that um, if it's cool, if it does good for people and we can learn about it, then we'll probably bring it in and we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get educated on it and we'll try to, try to add some benefit for the members there. And I think it all, it all, it all hinged off the community. Um, yeah. We trained with some different type of objects and moved a little bit more. And uh, one of our girls came up to us one day and she's like, hey, you guys want, have you guys ever done a Spartan race? And I'm like, I have not, I don't know why, I just haven't really done it. And she's like, your guys' training is perfect for Spartan race. Like you guys gotta do a Spartan race. And uh, she's like, would you do it with me? And so she's like, I'll sign up for the year if you commit to doing a Spartan race with me kind of thing. It's like, deal, all right, cool. So we did it. Uh, Heidi and I went out for our first Spartan race together. And- um, Absolutely terrible. Really? Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> I was terrible, I was terrible. You finished yeah. it. Yeah, finished. And right, then after right. that, we just started. The, the harder obstacles were like, why don't we just implement it in the gym so we could practice for the next one? Because we, off the bat, we signed up for our trifecta. If we were going to go into Spartan, we might as well just go big. Yeah. If you're going to do it. Yeah. And it's so, one of those things when you do it, you just fall in love with it. Like, you know, if it resonates with you, you either really love it or you really hate it. There's no in between. It's that's polar opposites. You either, it, like, it, it's everything you've ever looked for. The suffering, there's like healing in that weird suffering. Or, um, or it's just suffering and people are like, why did I sign up for this? This is awful. We call this the dirty side of the gym because the sand and the, the <laughs> atlas stones and all that kind of jazz. So which is, what well, weight's the big blue one? Uh, this guy here, man, this is what we call the Hulk stone. This is a 215. Um, <laughs> And then buckets, if you're at all familiar with Spartan bucket carries nice. are awful, so you got to practice them. Uh, yeah, the Hulkstone, dude, is the real deal. <laughs> so yeah, it's a 215 boy. Um, and there's some different exercise we do with the, uh, with the Atlas Stones, but- So you, can you pick that one up then? I, I, I can, man. Yeah. Uh, I can on a good day. <laughs> in my, oh, dude. I need this how I work, too. He's like, yeah, let's see, I'll pick it up. I'm not going to put it over my shoulder, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And then the other exercises is now what you would do is either set it on like a shelf okay. or um, we compete in a competition called Epic Series. In an Epic Series, they have you throw the ball over your shoulder. Um, and this, uh, this was no joke. They, uh, it used to be a 160. And then uh, we came out for one competition. One day they just had the 215 out there and it, uh, it stumped all the strong dudes. Um, it was nasty. So. And what's, yeah. what, what are the, what's the buckets? Tell, tell so me about the buckets, that one. Um, so bucket carrying Spartan is probably the most suffering specific obstacle at Spartan. They just give you a bucket for the men. <laughs> it's close to 80 or 90 pounds. Right. And um, you're going to carry that bucket. You, the, what happens is you get a bucket, an empty bucket, and there's a big pile of rocks. Yeah. So you fill your uh, bucket up with all those little pebbles, and they have holes in the top of the bucket. Right. And they, the old way it used to work is that if you could see daylight through the holes, your bucket wasn't filled enough. Right. Right. So you got to fill it up, carry it, and then this is a pretty heavy bucket. Ooh. So and then you carry the bucket, normally close to a quarter mile. <laughs> yeah, um, it's just awful, man. Yeah, just a <laughs> whole different kind of suffering. You've got a spear throw target. So yeah, so, tell, tell me what's going on here. Yeah, you have to give me a throw spear now. Well, actually, you have Heidi's so throw you, spear. She's dope. Do you literally throw spears? At you literally throw a spear. The whole ambition with Spartan is you throw it from 20 to 25 feet, and uh, the spear is supposed to stick in the bale of hay. Right. And so if it, you only get one throw, the okay. way Spartan works is any obstacle you fail, you have to you have to do 30 burpees for every obstacle. So you get one throw to make it. If you miss, you do 30 burpees. Um, we just recently built the Olympus wall. Uh, the Olympus wall, is uh, another really tough one at Spartan. This is a tough obstacle. So the way it works is normally like a, a bale of hay here. And once you get up onto the wall, uh, I'm in 
I'm in slacks, mind you. Yeah. Um, but you are meant to traverse across the wall. Oh, that's interesting with the uh, <laughs> with dress shoes on. Uh, <laughs> but you're meant to traverse across the wall, having your feet without having your feet touch the ground. So who comes up with the ideas for the for the for the kit? Do you look at what's going on in Spartan and then you get someone to build it, or? Pretty, pretty much, yeah. yeah. We um, we try to have a, most of the major Spartan obstacles. So yeah, we try to we try to build most of the Spartan obstacles. The ones that they call the burpee makers. The burpee makers are normally the obstacles right. that most people are likely to fail. Yeah. Um, most people don't do burpees over a wall or carrying a bucket, but a lot of people aren't going to get through the monkey bars or through the multi rig or getting the spear throw perfect. So we try to make sure we have all those major obstacles. Last part to say about like what I really am passionate about is the leadership library, and so. We okay. talked earlier about self-development yeah and um what we want to do is create a little bit of like a third space for the members here right. um, somewhere between work and home that they can hang out um and have a place to do their work uh do their homework for the students that train here um and also just give them resources so it's kind of like a leave one take one thing members can uh take a book whenever they see fit if they've got an extra book that they don't want they can bring it um we joke that a uh a missing books worth a hundred burpees, but we don't hold anybody really accountable for it. But um. so, um, so tell tell me a bit about you guys. You know what? What? How, how did you two meet for a start? <laughs> um, well, it was back in 2007. I was going to Cal State Fullerton, and right. I needed a part-time job, so I started working at 24 Hour Fitness. 24 Hour Fitness. Yeah. Okay. So right. in Fullerton. Um, Were you a, tra a trainer? Or? I was just front desk. Okay. So, I said hi to everybody, made sure everyone got uh, checked in, you know, just basic stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, he walked into 24 Hour Fitness with a couple of friends that I knew from college. Right. And I was trying to uh, hook him up with my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> just her type. <laughs> um, and then he started working at 24 about a month later. And she didn't stand a chance. I saw, I saw her <laughs> game was strong and uh, swooped her up 10 years later. Here we are. Boom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so he had, you, had, you had your eye on that straight away then. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I walked in with my buddies. So, yeah, I was uh, actually like, training my buddies, I guess, at 24 when I walked in. And she's at the front. I told my friends, like, yo, I'm going to get that one, bro. I'm going to get that. Verbatim. Mm -hmm. yeah, verbatim. <laughs> and, and so what were you doing? Were you a... You a Train, personal trainer or? You know, um, uh, so I, not so much at the time. I was just a football player. I was a college football player. And okay. so um, my buddies were always asking me like, hey man, will you help me work out? Will you help me work out? And so when I wasn't at football practice, I would take my buddies to 24 Hour Fitness and I'd just help them out a little bit. Right. And so that was how it all started. And then um, somewhere around the lines if I needed a job as well. And I heard 24 Hour Fitness is hiring salespeople. So I was, I was like, I'll give it a shot. Oh, so you started in sales. Mm -hmm. It was actually just meant to be a job. I didn't know if that was really what I wanted to do. At the time, I was going to school to be a teacher. Okay. And um, I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. That was my what I was <laughs> going to school for. Really? And it's funny because there's a lot of parallels in how we yeah. teach and yeah, coach definitely. and all that stuff now. But um, so I don't, say it's, I don't think it's a crazy different field. Yeah. But, it's like uh, teaching kindergartners sometimes. Oh, shoot. I'm just okay. kidding. Can you take that out, <laughs> oh. Don't do that. So, um, but I, I was actually really good at selling personal training. So the way the memberships work is you're supposed to, sell, if you sell memberships, a certain percentage of those was also supposed to get a personal trainer attached with it. Right. And it was like 10%. I was attaching like 50, 60%. Like everybody I talked to got a personal trainer. Really? And um, So you're a good sales guy then? I okay. guess so. I just got, I, I had a trainer when I was in high school. Um, I went to a place called Acceleration Indiana, which is, I'm from Indiana initially. Right. Um, and they helped me work on my 40 speed and stuff for football. And that, ends up, that ended up being the reason I got out of high school to be able to play at the college level. Right. And so I had a coach at some point. So it was easy for me to talk about why I think a coach could help somebody. Right. Okay. Okay. Sure. And do you think that in, in terms of sales then, do you think having that sort of background in understanding what you're doing makes you, you, know, make, makes you good in selling as well? You, yeah, I think that uh, I think that if you're trying to sell something, you better you better you damn sure better be passionate about it. Yeah. Um, it, like I, it always bugs me when you got like a Ford salesman trying to that drives a Chevy or something like that. Like, do you really believe in your product? I tell coaches that a lot. Trainers that don't have other trainers, like you don't you don't pay somebody to make you better as a coach. So you you're telling me you don't really believe in coaching. Right. right? So just explain that again. So, so if you really believe in coaching, right, you would have a coach. Right. Right. Okay. If you really believe a coach could benefit anybody, then yeah. why wouldn't you be working on your development and you getting better? Yeah. And so I tell our coaches all the time, go find somebody that pushes you or challenges you or um, continues to help you grow. Right. That's what a coach does. A coach helps somebody get somewhere they wouldn't get on their own. Right. And so um, I definitely believe in coaching. Yeah. And because I believe in coaching, it's it's 
it's not sales to sell somebody coaching. It's me sharing something I truly believe everybody could benefit from. Yeah. And it's an easy sell at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an interesting point because you know, quite a few trainers I meet have an issue with the word sales. You know, they, they feel it's not something that they feel comfortable or should do in a lot of cases. And I, I guess the way you put it is quite interesting because you're, you're not selling people, but you're sharing something sure. that you know. Uh, I, I think that's quite a good way of putting it for people that uh, may be concerned about feeling salesy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I think everything does have to be sold, though, at the end of the day. I think that um, there's nothing wrong with sales and there's nothing. One of the things that we want for people, we want to be able to provide an environment where we can have great coaches. In order to have great coaches, great talent, we have to be able to pay great talent and great coaches. To recruit great talent and great coaches, we have to be able to compensate them, which means we have to be compensated, which means that if we're doing a great service, it's okay to have a fair exchange for a great service, which in this situation would be money. Um, there's nothing wrong, like, we can't do what we do for free, and I think we do a lot for people. I think a good coach does a lot for people. Um, and so I think we should be able to make a living doing what we do. I think we're, we're valuable as coaches. Right. Um, but if you don't have the skill to persuade people to take action on anything, whether it's coaching or whether it's even, um, some people won't like go to the dentist when they need to unless you sell them on it. Like you, sometimes you just have to be persuasive. Yeah. They, people are just uh, natural procrastinators. They don't take action unless you help them sometimes. Right, okay. <laughs> so so what, what, what are a couple of the things that you took from that time where you were both at 24 Hour Fitness that, that you're using today? Was there? Was there? Um, I think I came from the more service managerial side of things and he came from more of the sales and fitness side. So it was, it, it's always been a great parallel to each other because we had both sides of the spectrum when it came to business. and owning a gym, or not owning a gym, running a gym. So I knew all the behind the scenes on how to run a gym and he knew how to get the clients. Get the clients. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we, we were both managers at 24 Fitness for a very long time at separate clubs. So we knew um, the what came out of 24 Fitness were the success routines and all the different, um, uh, just, different tactics that made a business a corporation. Right. So we knew what to implement from 24 and just brought it here. Right. And what was a couple of the examples of key things that stood out from that? Um, I think just structure. Structure and making sure that um, you had a success routine for every single aspect of your gym. So right. everything should be from how to say hello to someone, how to answer the phone, how to um, ring up a personal training agreement. Every, every little thing that comes with the business should be detailed. Right. And it should be... Um, like systemized. System or, yeah, mm -hmm. everything should just be very systematic in order for things to go smoothly. Right. Because if someone else came in, there should just be something in place that they can just plug into. Yeah. It's just not in your head. No. Yeah. By yeah. any chance, have you read the E-Myth? I have. Okay, so the e -myth, um is one of my favorite books, and they, they talk and they talk a lot about the idea of the different phases of business, infancy to adolescence to maturity, and they talk about um, to everything Heidi's saying that there has there the business has to be bigger than you, right? And in order to do that, you have to you can't be the bottleneck in your business. So if the only way we know how to onboard employees is just by whatever Josh feels like teaching them that day, what happens if Josh is sick, we have a new employee, then a new employee doesn't get trained for a week or what, right? There should be an onboarding process for when you have a new employee. There should be um, a new member onboarding process. How do you make sure every member has the same experience when they come in? And it's not just, how's the coach feeling that day? If it was just Josh's training and I was the only coach, um, if I'm having a bad day and you're a new client, you're gonna get a bad experience. Right. Right. But if we have systems on the way that a client's greeted when they walk into the door, um, how their measurements are performed on their first session, how their movement assessments done on the first session, um, making sure that every client has a replicatable experience. Yeah. Um, Ema talks about the turnkey solution. Right. And it's not the idea that I don't know if for us we're looking to franchise fitness on fire, but we almost have to treat the business as if we were going to. That everything is done in the sense of how would this be done if there were 100 fitness on fires? Right, and everything that we do in the gym is asked by that question, right? What would, if an employee calls out sick, or I'm sorry, if an employee wants vacation, um, how would that be done in Florida at the Fitness on Fire in Florida? 
um, to make sure that that process is the same for the fitness on fires in California and so on and so forth. Right. So that turnkey solution is what I got out of 24 Hour Fitness, yeah. which is they helped us understand how important those systems were in a business. And I think a lot of trainers that open a gym, they have the passion behind, like, I love kettlebells and training stuff. Um, but that's not why they fail. It's not because they don't know enough. It's not because they don't care about people. It's possibly because they don't have the business acumen or the systems to run an actual gym. They're just a personal trainer. Right, right, okay. Yeah, and I think um, one thing, coming from a corporation and coming from just um, a bigger company, co becoming smaller and starting what you want to start, you bring, I think, the personality out of a of a business so we were able to incorporate more of the homey feel so just the welcome just good vibes like yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to go anywhere where it's just bad vibes so I think um, just making sure everyone where it doesn't feel like robots working at a gym like you're interacting with actual people right people who know where you've been have are where you want to be and just like it's just real yeah 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 so i guess there's balancing that sort of process like scripted with the human yeah sure. element yeah <laughs> and i think working for a bigger company nothing against 24 finish 24 finish was awesome they did a lot of good things for us gave us a lot of good opportunities yeah. um and it was neat working at so many 24 fitnesses in orange county we opened up fitness on fire square in the middle of all those 24 hour fitnesses so it's something where um, we've been in the marketplace for a decade each, so if we go to the grocery store, people are like, hey, aren't you the guy from the gym? Like, hey, I am, what are you up to now? Man, I'm doing this, and they end up becoming a member at some point. Um, so that's really nice. So 24 was great to us, but I do think that there is, when you look at a bigger gym like that, to Heidi's point, the personality isn't always, um, like you don't know what the personality of a 24 hour fitness is, it's just like a gym that you're signing up for. Right. Um, versus here, we were able to see where we could do better for people and make it really about the people. Like for a good example would be um, just recently I had somebody um, come in and they wanted to do a trial month with us. Um, our trial months aren't crazy expensive, but they couldn't um, afford the whole down payment right then and there. So they asked if they could do a payment every Friday and split it into four payments. Um, and the 24 Fitness was like, no, you have to pay it today. And that was the rule. But now we're able to say, okay, hey, it seems like that's the right thing to do for you, Matt. We're gonna take care of you on that, man. Totally fine, whatever. Whatever's easy. It doesn't have to be hard to, to make it work for people. Right. Um, and yeah, there's a balance between the systems of all of that and also just trying to do the right thing for people. Right. And I think we're right in that in-between space with the size of our business right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're at 24 Hour Fitness doing two different roles. Did you both sort of decide there that you wanted to leave together or how did, how did that next step happen? We got married and... Well, she were at 24 Hour Fitness. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So we got uh, engaged in 2011, got married 2013. Um, but I think it came to the point where we didn't want to be stuck at 24 Hour Fitness for the rest of our lives. Right. Like it paid well. Yeah. It paid really well. Um, but was that enough to, to live like we had bigger dreams than 24 Hour Fitness. Right. And I think um, we, on our honeymoon in Costa Rica, he made me listen to, he didn't make me, <laughs> but the whole trip we listened to um, Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> <laughs> like the extended audio tape version. Like his version back in like 1900. <laughs> um, so we just had a lot of time to think and really collaborate on what we wanted as a couple. And, um, you know, we're in our prime. We need to have kids. We want to have a house. And California and Irvine's not cheap. So we needed to think out of the box and just, Josh always wanted to own a gym, so. The other part of it too is it wasn't just about the money either. Um, it was also about the time and money freedom. It's the idea that, um, to Heidi's point, we were, um, on the upper, we were in the upper end of our pay scales and all the positions we ever held at that organization. They, again, they took care of us, they did really good by us. Um, but it was one of those things where we were absolutely training hours for dollars, right? That at some point, if we wanted to start a family, I didn't want to be the dad that has, um, that works 60, 70 hours a week and his kids have the coolest gear and the nicest shoes and um, all that, but they never see dad at the football games. 
I'd rather be, I'd honestly rather be dirt poor and be able to be at my kids' football games and spend time with my children than be um, behind a cubicle all day. Right. And so, um, and obviously I don't think it has to be either or, and that's what the next part for us is, is we believe in abundance. We believe in the idea that um, if you really set an ambitious, you hold, uh, you set an ambition, you hold that definite purpose in your heart with a burning desire, and then you, you're willing to put the time, the effort, the sacrifice, the work into it, um, you can build anything that you want to build. I remember when our initial goal was to have 40 clients. Um, then I remember it was 100 clients. Then I remember it was 200 clients. It, the, the dream keeps growing because we're putting the work in and we have the dream, we have the ambition, we have that, that passion, that fire. So I think that, that day when you wake up in the morning and you're like, I gotta go, man. I gotta, go. I gotta do what my heart's telling me to do. Um, you gotta go, you gotta do it. That's it. And I, I came home to Heidi one day and I told her, I was like, I kind of miss training people. I was a club manager at the time in 24 Hour Fitness. I was like, right. I miss training people. I miss the one-on-one -on -one interaction. I just don't feel like I'm fulfilled doing what I'm doing right now. And she's like, we've been talking about that for a little while. And I was like, when are you gonna do something about it? So that next day I walked in, I gave my two week and we started Fitness on Fire. So you, you, you gave your notice, your two weeks period. And then, you know, this doesn't just happen. This costs money. You sure. need the, what, what's the bit in the middle? Part of it is respectful to 24 Hour Fitness. I don't think we did anything out of character or out of integrity um, against that organization. Um, I am, when she talks about we got married, we got married. When we came back, I got a promotion the day I came back from our honeymoon and was promoted to be another club manager in another location. And I spent about a year in that location as the club manager and I thought that growth was what I was looking for and the itch that I was trying to satisfy, but it just wasn't. Um, I did, there's just something else inside. So. I started in the, back, in the background, I started kind of writing the business plan and I started, um, I probably had six months of premeditation of what it was that we were going to try and create. Um, I got all my legal stuff done, you know, got our LLC filed in. Um, if, you, if anybody's ever started a business, then you know there's more paperwork than you'd ever imagine. <laughs> um, and people asked me the other day, somebody asked me like, so what do I do in this situation? I'm like, gosh, you don't even remember. Like, how do you not remember? I'm like, dude, you know how much stuff you have to do when you start a business? There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, but started doing all that stuff behind the scenes. So the day that I gave my two weeks, I was ready to start trying to take my first client. Right. Um, at first, uh, the did you ambition. Have a uh, the, did you have this location? Did the you? ambition was actually just to rent space and right. just. Um, and honestly, my ambition at first was to somewhat do a little bit of what you're doing today. Um, and that's something we can talk about at some point too. But I, I have a little bit of a YouTube channel as well. And what we used to do is uh, we used to go around and interview fitness entrepreneurs and people had like specific niches. Um, and we create like a commercial forum um, in exchange for like a training session slash education for me. And I just wanted to be an authority in the fitness industry. And I, I know that there's all types of ways to make income when it comes to affiliate links and um, sponsorship of different programs and so on and so forth. So I thought if I built a big enough content engine that um, maybe we could create like passive streams of income that way. Right. And I was just gonna kind of train um, as that built because I just love training. Um, so I, I was renting space at the time. Uh, so I left, started renting space, started training clients one-on-one. -on -one, and it was just me at the time. Heidi was still at 24 Hour Fitness, so she was still carrying her benefits and all that stuff, <laughs> right? And um, the, we, were going, we were training, I was training private clients. I was going out and filming the YouTube videos on Fridays. And then my training business just started growing like crazy. And uh, before I knew it, I, had, I was up to like 40 personal clients. And um, things were good, but I started not having as much time for the YouTube stuff. Right. And what's the, what was the, are you still running the YouTube? Yeah, we still have the YouTube channel. It's uh, the Fitness on Fire TV. Fitness on Fire mm -hmm. TV. Okay. Yeah, and it's been pretty cool. Uh, we got, uh, you know, a couple, um, we're in the hundreds of thousands now, which is cool of views. Excellent. Um, and it's neat because it, it makes us pennies. Uh, we don't do much with it, but yeah. it, it's, like, we don't do much with it. It makes us pennies. That's, yeah. that's like, that's cool. Um, so it's a start. Um, so I went to Idea World, um, the Idea World Fitness Convention, yeah. and Todd Durkin was there, um, and he had a one day um, life in the, uh, a day in the life of impact or something like that, or it was a something like that. I think it was however the, whatever the title was. Um, so it was a day where you spend a day, and Todd Durkin gives you all of his business secrets about what he's doing in his gym in uh, Fitness Quest Ten in San Diego and. Um, how he's built himself up to be this authority in the fitness industry and all these things. And um, when he started talking about his team, it made me realize immediately how much I missed the leadership element of being a club manager, a fitness manager. I always had employees and a team at 24 Hour Fitness. And when I started training on my own, it was kind of lonely. Um, it's just me training clients, but I missed like leading other coaches and stuff like that. 
So it got me thinking, like, I think I do want a gym. I, I think I really do. In my heart, it was kind of scary. So I think I buried that dream. I had that dream a long time ago. Like when I was 18 years old, I was like, I want a gym, a gym one day. Right. But when I left 24 Hour Fitness, like, mm, do I bet the ranch on it? I'm not sure. And <laughs> so um, let's try and create some other stuff and see how. Um, but I came back from the idea world and I was just fired up. I was like, dude, it's time. Let's go. And we had 40 clients at the time. So I was like, I, I can cover the overhead at least. Let's, let's give it a shot. So I started looking for a facility. It was six months of renting space building up my clientele, getting some cash, and then um, come January, uh, um, six months later, January 2014, 20, 15. 2015, um, January 2015, we ended up uh, getting the spot. Right. Yeah. And, and you just, so you, so you just funded that out of your, your, your training class? Um, and then, yeah, very transparently, um, it was kind of like a 50-50 thing. We ended, up, uh, we ended up having quite a bit of cash from training business, and then um, one of my clients was looking to um, invest in another property at the time and she was we were training one day and she's just like she's telling me how much she didn't want to invest in another property but she needed to do something with her money she needed to invest I'm like well I'm thinking about opening a gym next <laughs> year uh, what do you what do you think about this she's like you know I'd actually be interested in looking at that and I was like oh really okay so I put together a business plan for her and I showed her um, basically so she kind of uh, she kind of went in with us on it right it's kind of cool yeah. yeah so it helped us get a, a start I think a lot of I think it's important I like the question you asked there because we don't talk to a lot of people about our silent partner right um, but as we're talking to maybe other coaches or other trainers um, I do think that you'd be surprised that your clients would double down with you right. um, and they would bet on you right. um, and you have to understand partnerships and all that it's a whole different game um, so you need to make sure it's the right partner in the right situation, all that. And for us, it's been blessings. It's all been good. Yeah. Um, but I do think that if you, I, I heard a quote this morning that said, um, you can have anything in life that you ask for as long as you understand how to ask appropriately. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> That's very nice. So, so what would it? It sounds as though it all went to plan. And uh, reading your book, maybe that's the law of attraction working for you. But did was there any? low points in that whole process you know or did it just all work as planned you want to you want me um <laughs> i got low points yeah i was like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um so i just read a book recently by darren hardy called the entrepreneur roller coaster right. um just dropping a couple books out there because yeah. I'm, a, I'm a reader um but it talks about the idea that um sometimes the day that's gonna be the highest high for you as an entrepreneur will also be the lowest low. It's like um, you don't really have like, when you work a nine to five and you know what your paycheck's gonna look like every day, you know what your schedule looks like, you know um, what the challenges you're gonna face are every day, it's the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, I think you live at like this, this nice even kill. Honestly, in my opinion, that would be boring for me, but for some people like that security or that safety feels good, like that right. certainty. Um, in entrepreneurship, it's not that at all. It's, um, Oh my God, we might not make it, we might not make it, we might fail. Oh wait, we succeeded. We had something really big happen. And it's like, oh my God, I'm so depressed. I don't even want to get out of bed today. And it's like, oh my gosh, like I can't wait to uplift the world. Like there's, there's definitely not only mood swings and all these things, and you have to learn how to balance those things as an entrepreneur, because not every day is going to be a great day. Um, but I think you have to really hold steadfast to your dream and your vision. You have to believe in you and us. We have to believe in ourselves. We have to believe in the dream and the vision, and the passion, and whatever's in our heart of hearts to do. Um, but I will tell you, there's been some lows. There's not all highs and positives. And honestly, for the first two years, we didn't make like any money. Like we made no money. We went from making all this money in 24 Fitness. We gave up all of our salary, all of our, our stuff. We had some money in the bank, which was okay. Um, but then it, it, um, we ran out of money in the bank. We got like broke, broke. Like it, it, it it's, I think it's all a part of the game. It's like, uh, the month that you feel like, oh my gosh, I can't pay my bills. The next month you make a $20,000 bonus. Like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then the next month it's, you know, so, so on and so forth. Um, there's always highs and lows. And so I don't have any real specifics yeah. other than the fact of like the first year, the first two years, we didn't make very much money at all. And right as we started to get some cash flow in and we started to get up above all the overhead and all this stuff, um, our neighbor moved out. And our neighbor moved out and we were like, okay, do we want to stay complacent with what we're doing right now? Or do we want to gamble the next level up in business to take over that next space, expand our space and see if we can double our membership? And so we ended up taking the cash that we were about to start making and put it right back into the business and it opened up the wall. And, but it was the right step. It was the right move. So while we faced brokenness some more, um, we had to do that to grow the business to the next level. So there's always going to be that, those trade-offs, I think. But yeah. um, again, holding steadfast to the vision, it's like, dude, I get it. We're going to be broke a little bit longer. 
but I know, like I know, like I know that what's on the other side of all of this struggle and hustle and the ups and the downs is going to be everything that we've ever dreamed of and everything we want to create. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, one big thing is totally separate is because we're a personal training studio, we have private clients. Your coaches are going to have private clients and those relationships built um, with their clients. So I think um, when it comes to owning a gym, when you have trainers leave, you might see an influx of business loss. Yeah. So how do you combat that? How, are you, how do you become proactive on losing those clients when a trainer decides to leave? Like if they decided, there, I mean, there's always different scenarios, but I think that's where our semi-private sessions came about because how do we harness the community more and, and not make it so clicky yeah. where Josh is I'm only, only here to train with Heidi today. Yeah, it's just Josh and Heidi or, you know, you just train with Josh and you just want to train with Josh. Semi-private sessions allows our community and our members to train with other coaches and get the feel of other coaches. So it's not just when Josh leaves, that client's going to leave. Yeah. That client is going to stay because they are a part of the community. They feel like they can train with other coaches here. Yeah. So I think that's um, one proactive thing we did to minimize excess loss. Yeah. yeah. And going back to your question about like, what were some of the lows? We had a coach leave and it took a, a bunch of business right. and out of the losses or out of the, the low moments normally come really big successes. So semi-private training now is our most popular product. And because we had a low moment where we had a coach leave and take a bunch of business, um, we discovered that we needed to be able to prepare for that better in the future and we created a different program. Right. That different program is now our breadwinner. And so I think that if you're, if you got your head on a swivel as an entrepreneur, understand that if you have a low, 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 there's a high right around the corner. It's yeah. just a matter of like hanging in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's a couple, because I, I say one of the biggest strains on the relationship is financial and uh, having your partner um, going through those things at the same time H how how do you keep you know what the, the psychology of the relationship and the business how how did you sort of make that work then <laughs> um, you can start okay um, so I think I think for a big part is we, we communicate I think that's it sounds so simple, and everybody's like, oh, okay, good, you have to communicate in a relationship. But like, people don't do it, though, <laughs> right? And so um, there's a book called Fierce Conversations, and they talk about, um, like, what are you pretending not to know? That's a very interesting question. Um, we don't, I don't think there's ever anything that we're pretending not to know about one another. If there's something that's bothering us, or like, I don't like the way you, you talked to me today when you told me, when I messed up that membership agreement and you kind of yelled at me about it, I thought you kind of treated me a little wrong there. Um, she'll tell me, she's like, you're a little bit of a jerk today, Josh. Um, so I think that for us, the communication side of it, um, we handle communication head on. If something's bugging us, we talk about it. We don't really walk out of the, the gym um, with gym drama and take that home with us. And right. I think we've worked really hard at that and that's tough. Yeah. Um, as far as the financial side, when the peaks and valleys go, again, I think it is communication. I think, um, you know, however people feel about this comments, whatever, but um, I'm gonna say as a man, I feel like the man is supposed to be the leader of the family a lot of the times. And so for me, I think my role is to continue to communicate the vision with my lady to be able to um, help her keep the faith in what we're doing on the day because i'm definitely the why guy or i'm the i'm the yeah i'm the why guy i'm the um i've got the, i've got all the ideas and the creativity and what if this could be what if we did this what if we opened five of these and what if we and it gets overwhelming sometimes i'm like <laughs> dear god <laughs> well, heidi's the how person heidi um heidi hears the vision and she's like yeah but this is really what is going to have to happen in order for that to go on and so I think it's great that we have both of those. If we were both just like the airy fairy dreaming people and yeah. nobody was a how person, nothing would get done, yeah. right? But on the other end, if we were both how people, like I don't know what the, the future of the business would look like if we're not dreaming bigger. So I think we have a good balance of those two things. Um, and so a lot of the times she'll come to me to tell me that there's a financial struggle in the business and then I dream up how we're gonna get out of it and then she implements it. And so I think we're just a good team to be honest with you, but it, yeah. I think it goes back to communication. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I think um, knowing when to separate business and like your, 
your love life and like your personal relationship. Like you have to know when to turn the business off. Right. When like Thursdays, Thursdays are our date night. So we'll still do like computer work and business stuff, but it's a time for us to just talk to each other other than fitness on fire although it's sometimes hard to find <laughs> something outside of <laughs> outside of work to talk about but life. so yeah i think just the separate knowing when to separate the two right um and knowing that you're not just business partners that it's it's deeper than that and just knowing that and knowing just knowing each other yeah they just the communication of it all yeah and so yeah. i'm going to go back to your question because i think your question was really about like with the financial side of um, when you're in a low moment, how, how do you balance that as a couple and then that, in yeah. that struggle? Um, and I think the answer that we're giving you here is about the idea that our relationship is bigger than the money. Um, our dream is bigger than the money currently. Right. And so I think holding steadfast to that dream, and I think that we fight every day for that. We talk about the vision every single day. Um, so on the days that it is the lowest of the low, it's like, look what we're shooting for. Right. Look at where we're going. Right. Um, this won't always be the... This won't always be the our reality, it's gotta be, you know, we're gonna get to wherever we're going, so on and so forth. And um, it's worked so far. And, and talking about that vision then, so what is, what is the future? What's the next five to 10 or whatever? What, what does that look like for you? You know, what, sure. what are you? And you know, this is actually a hard question because as we talk about the vision, the vision is, um, I don't know if it's about 100 fitness on fires. Right. Um, I think when people talk about growth, I think that everybody expects that should be my answer, that you should have multiple locations and operate in multiple states and countries and so on and so forth. Um, really for us, it's about, it's about like value that we can provide. And so we've talked a lot about the idea that we want Fitness on Fire to be synonymous with personal training. Right. And so what's that mean? If you, if you walk into a warehouse like this, a lot of the times the first, people, uh, first question people ask me is, is this a CrossFit? I get that question a lot, and um, we have answers. We have ways that we uh, um, script and teach our staff how to deal with that question. Um, it, so they, I'll give it to you real quick. So if somebody says, this is a CrossFit, I say, well, tell me what you think about CrossFit. And they'll be like, oh, dude, CrossFit is life, bro. And I'm like, okay, dude, this is just like CrossFit. Then we lift weights <laughs> and all this stuff. And if you ask the same question, is this like a CrossFit? I'm like, what do you think about CrossFit? I'm like, dude, my friend broke their neck doing CrossFit. It's so crazy. I just don't think it's safe at all. Like, we're nothing at all like CrossFit. What we, so, and we'll tell them why we're different than a CrossFit. But the reason I brought that up is when people look at a warehouse like this, they, they're like, is this a CrossFit? And what I think CrossFit has done so well is they've created a whole separate brand of fitness. It's a whole separate brand of fitness that warehouses with open space look like a CrossFit. I would like one day for people to go into a personal training gym like you did today and be like, I haven't seen something like this. People say, I run a personal training gym. So you like, oh, is that like a fitness on fire? Right, that we become synonymous with all things training. That's right. the ambition. And I think that nowadays with social media, with YouTube, with Instagram, with um, Facebook, with all these different means and content or blogs and the internet being in its infancy phases, I believe, um, I think that you can have a really big reach without having a really big footprint. And so I don't know if it's about 100 Fitness on Fires, but I would like to have the same reach as 100 Fitness on Fires. Right. And uh, Todd Durkin's facility um, in San Diego, uh, Fitness Quest 10, really inspired me. He's one of the first coaches I ever saw that when I was growing up, I thought if you wanted to be a personal trainer, you had to be broke. Like, um, it was just like, it was like part of the job scope. Um, like, you live in your mom's basement, like, you, you don't make any money, you, you smell funny, you know, like all that stuff. Like, I thought that was like the thing. And then I saw Todd, and I started following Todd, and I saw that um, he was a trainer that was out there making a living by owning a gym, by giving people, like, by being a coach. And again, I, I think there's so much we do for people as coaches that I think it's ridiculous that it's hard to make money being a trainer. I think it should be, trainers should make money hand over fist in my opinion, because I know what we do for people. I'm a marriage counselor, a business coach, uh, I'm a personal trainer, a nutritionist. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, I'm everything for a lot of people. Um, I think we do more for people sometimes than their doctors do for them. We see them every single day. We have influence over these people and how, what kind of decisions they're making about their health every day. Um, why can't I, why am I, why do, why do coaches struggle to make the kind of money that a doctor that sees that client once a, once a, a year and tells them, mm, just don't, don't run anymore, that's why your knees hurt. Like, well, give me something more than that, right? So anyways, um, I believe that coaches matter. I believe that coaches should be able to make money doing what they're doing. I'd like to be able to provide an engine where coaches could go somewhere and be able to do that. 
and um, in that essence also becoming like a category killer in the personal training field. Right. And that's kind of the bigger vision. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds quite inspiring. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I guess, it's, as you say, you know, it's, it's a different way. It's, it's, you know, you're still touching as many people, but not necessarily in the traditional way, you know, doing it in a slightly different way, which is, and, uh, which is, which is quite interesting. So in, in order for people to sort of be, un, you know, follow and get to know what you're doing, you've got your YouTube channel, which is Fitness on Fitness on, fitness on Fire, fire. TV. Oh. Yeah, um, and, and where else can, can we find you? So yeah, so we're, uh, we're on Instagram. Our Instagram's uh, fitness.on.fire. Right. Uh, we're on Facebook, Fitness on Fire OC, right. like Orange County. Um, and then uh, we also on our website, the fitnessonfireoc.com website, we have our own blog. Um, there's an email opt-in there. We do a lot through our email communication, things such as grocery shopping lists and uh, workouts of the week. Um, I think if you opt in for the email list on the webpage, there's a, there's a 25 workout guide on there that people can do at home with their body weight and right. some of our staple things that we do here in the gym. Um, so we're a little bit actually all over the place, yeah. Yeah, and, and the final thing then is if you, if, you know, you, Best piece of advice, someone who's who's just working at a at a gym. I won't put no names, but they're they're working. They're a PT. They're uh, working on the reception, and they're thinking they've got they've had this dream like you. What what would be the best piece of advice you could give for someone in that position that wants to go on and do something like you guys did? Uh, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's simple of a question. That is a tough question. <laughs> I think you have to believe in yourself. You really thoroughly have to believe that you can. Um, I, I believe in possibility. If there's anything that I want to represent in my lifetime, it's possibility. I want Fitness on Fire to be successful so I can show those coaches that you're talking to that it can be done. Um, so if you don't have a dream, you got to get a dream and you got to believe in yourself and, and in that dream. So I think the first advice would be get a dream. Like you got to have something you believe um, that you have a burning desire for, right? If that's already there and it's just like, I'm kind of on the fence, but I don't know if I want to chase that dream or not because I don't know, maybe I'll fail. I'll ask, what if you fail? What if you fail, so what? What if you fail? But at the same time, what if you fly, right? What if you, what if you take a chance? And um, what if you can build everything you ever wanted? Isn't that worth any risk, right? It's better than living life going back 50 years from now and be like, gosh, man, I, I wish when I had that burning desire, I would have tried. I think you gotta try. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, it's an inspiring story. Um, I'm sure there's lots more we could talk about, but next, we'll have to come back again and do that workout. Sure. Pick up the bucket, slow some spears. But, there we uh, go. But Heidi, it's thank nice you very to meet much. You. Yeah, Josh, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.